Uh, today we have a quality focus grand rounds with Dr. Arnold Friedman and Sandra Gilmore from the Blood Management and Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Program at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Dr. Arnold Friedman is the Chairman of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He received his medical degree from New York University School of Medicine and completed his residency training at Yale New Haven Hospital. Throughout his career, he has gained interest in bloodless medicine and surgery and has become a strong advocate for the appropriate use of blood and blood products. Sandra Gilmore serves as program director for the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery program. They work with others in this innovative, multidisciplinary program to coordinate bloodless healthcare and implement various techniques and technologies to avoid use and overuse of transfused blood and its components. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you very much. I'm particularly honored to have my chairman from my residency days here, Dr. Case. And what I don't understand is how he could have been my chairman when I'm older than he is. In any case, um, I spent um, about six or seven years in Englewood, New Jersey, at Englewood Hospital at a time in the 90s when they were first um, introducing their, uh, the bloodless medicine and surgery program there. And a lot of the uh, things that I saw and learned about what you can do without blood transfusion uh, carried over to my work as I brought it to uh, Beth Israel and now to Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And what we'd like to do today, uh, Sandra and I, is talk a little bit about the approach to caring for patients who cannot accept blood transfusion. First of all, we have to start off talking about the ethical principles of refusal of treatment. Um, we, all know, we all know this, but sometimes it's difficult to accept. Everyone has the right to refuse treatment, even if to do so will cause them harm. Secondly, refusal of blood is analogous to a cancer patient refusing chemotherapy, an obese patient refusing to diet, a Catholic refusing to terminate a pregnancy in a high-risk medical situation. And so we have to put it into that perspective, um, rather than thinking of it as an oddity and, uh, and sort of a, a crazy patient. We deal with high-risk patients every single day. Um, the individual's beliefs are as much a part of them as their pancreas and their liver and everything else. Um, and so we have to accept that. But we deal with high-risk patients undergoing surgery and, and complex medical treatments every day, and we have to work with that. So if you happen to have a diabetic, you have to deal with blood sugars at the same time you're dealing with the primary problem. So that's sort of the way to approach the care of the patient who can't accept transfusion. So why do some patients refuse blood? Well, we see a lot of patients, particularly Jehovah's Witnesses, who refuse um, transfusion because of personal and religious beliefs. There's also a growing concern over the safety of the blood supply. Uh, personal um, reasons such as a family member who didn't do well after a transfusion had complications from it. These are all reasons why people refuse blood. And in fact, in our program uh, down at Beth Israel, we're seeing about 20% of the total population in the program are not Jehovah's Witnesses. This is uh, to give you a little historic perspective. Uh, the first physician to really care for a series of Jehovah's Witnesses and to talk about them and write about them in an organized way was the famous heart surgeon Denton Cooley. He uh, published a series of 542 cases of cardiovascular surgery in Jehovah's Witnesses with a mortality rate of 9.4%. Now, that sounds like a high number, but you have to remember when these patients were being cared for. It was in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, at which time this was not tr tremendously different from the background mortality rate. And if you look at their cases in this series of 542, blood loss was deemed to be the direct cause of mortality in only three patients, which is 0.5%, and it was a contributing factor in only 2.1%. So the total uh, that, that was attributed to the fact that these patients could not accept transfusion was under 3%. This is another study looking at 500 uh, cardiothoracic surgery patients. Uh, it was broken down into two groups. First of all, 19, 1991 to 2003 versus the, the, the later group, 2003 to 2012. You can see that the early group had a 3% mortality, the later group only 1%. And the improved outcomes uh, were largely attributed to the use of erythropoietin and raising uh, the hemoglobins of the patients in the second group to uh, 14 or over, which is pretty much the standard that our cardiothoracic surgeons use today in caring for patients who can't be transfused. 
And this is a much smaller study, but uh, just to show you that the, um, it looks at only 59 patients, but as you can see, the, um, the group that were Jehovah's Witnesses actually did better than the group that were um, in the control group. Uh, and again, attributable largely to the fact that they had higher hemoglobins, and uh, that was uh, accomplished through the use of intravenous iron and erythropoietin, or ESAs, erythrocyte stimulating agents. This is a report from 2014 in New Jersey. Uh, when I was at Englewood Hospital, we did not have cardiothoracic surgery in the 90s uh, because for some reason at the time that the certificates of needs were being issued, they, re they declined to apply for one. But they developed this large practice of uh, bloodless patients and as a result, uh, around 2000 or so, or in the early 2000s, they applied for and obtained a certificate of need for cardiac surgery to um, to provide care for the cardiothoracic surgery patients who could not accept blood. So it was, it, it was created, or they, they received their certificate of need based purely on this one um, issue. And what I'm showing you here is the report of their uh, outcomes. Uh, this, this is the statewide report that comes out every couple of years. And you can see in 2010, there was, if you look at the left uh, column, the left uh, was Englewood Hospital Medical Center. They are one of the two best in the state with zero mortality in this group, risk-adjusted mortality. And if you look straight up, you can see that the 6.53-day uh, post-op length of stay is right in the middle of everybody else's. So what I think all of these things show you is that in the surgical population, you can take care of complex patients uh, who can't accept transfusion and have outcomes that are at least as good, I won't say better, but at least as good as uh, patients who uh, do accept blood transfusion. So I know this is a group of um, medical people as opposed to surgical people, so I went back to the literature and looked for something that would apply to the medical, uh, to medical illnesses and medical therapies. And this is a, a study of 125 patients reported uh, by Patricia Ford, who's a well-known hematologist in Philadelphia who uh, runs a blood management and bloodless medical and, and surgery program uh, at Pennsylvania Hospital. And the story is she uh, was asked to take care of a patient with leukemia um, who was a Jehovah's Witness. A uh, patient needed a stem cell transplant. And so she hemmed and hawed, but she decided to do it. And she had a wonderful outcome. Everything was great. And so she was approached by a second patient. And she cared for the second patient. Unfortunately, the second patient did not survive. Had a very complicated course and wound up dying. So she was all set to stop taking care of Jehovah's Witnesses for stem cell transplantation until the family of the person who had died came to her and said, you know, if you don't do this, we, we recognize and accept the increased risk by not accepting transfusion, but if you don't do this, there's nobody else to care for, um, for our people who don't uh, accept transfusion who have these illnesses. And so she started caring for patients and uh, just a couple of years ago published the outcome. So this is a series of 125 patients who were treated with stem cell transplant for uh, leukemia and multiple myeloma. And um, what she did was she used what are, what have become really basic, simple uh, patient blood management techniques in the approach to these patients. First of all, she made sure all of them had good hemoglobins before they started the process. She also looked at her own data and recognized that uh, without transfusion, you can expect an average of about five grams per deciliter drop in hemoglobin over the course of uh, the, the treatment in order to uh, accomplish the transplant. And so she made sure all of them had hemoglobins above 11. She also did things like limiting iatrogenic blood loss by minimizing the number of phlebotomies using pediatric tubes. She stopped doing repetitive blood cultures when someone kept spiking fevers. She did one blood culture and, and, and did not keep repeating them. Um, and uh, they did things like um, control, blood, control additional blood loss by using progestins for women who were still menstruating, uh, using proton pump inhibitors to reduce the risk of hemorrhage from a GI bleed. So they did all of these things. They used mechanical DVT prophylaxis instead of heparin because they didn't want anything that might disturb uh, platelet function. And they used um, antithrombolytic agents, uh, specifically aminocaproic acid, as alternatives when the platelet count dropped below 30,000. And what they found is that they had a 4.8 more percent mortality, and at the time, the uh, national mortality rates ranged between 1 and 3.5% for similar procedures 
with patients who could accept transfusion. They found that uh, profound anemia was the cause of death in one patient, sepsis in one other, and multi-organ failure in another, and that most of the deaths, three, or at least the largest group of deaths, and there were 40 patients who, under, who uh, suffered cardiac, various cardiac complications, and it wasn't clear whether those might be related to the lack of transfusion or not. But they were clearly related to the risk group. The, uh, many of these patients had histories of heart disease. In addition, many of the uh, chemotherapeutic agents are cardiotoxic. So uh, th there wasn't much more they could say um, about that in this particular study. But the bottom line is they were able to get successful treatment. Um, the 100-day outcome, these were 30-day outcomes, the 100-day outcomes showed a 92% survival. So these patients uh, can do very, very well, even though they have complex issues and uh, they can be managed without transfusion. But the question is how? So that's what we're going to talk about now. First of all, there are principles of patient blood management which largely came out of the care of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, things to do to optimize the care of the patient without the use of blood. And basically there are three categories. The first is to maximize reserve. Essentially, correcting, uh, correcting um, hemoglobin levels, patients who are anemic need to be corrected, patients who have um, problems with coagulation, platelet counts, do things that will correct those problems before you start the treatment. The second is to find ways to minimize blood loss. So for instance, if you're doing a liver resection, it was not uncommon to take out that big hunk of liver and then deal with the bleeding later. Now meticulous hemostasis is applied so that if you see one bleeder, you stop and you stop, you control the bleeding from that vessel. Then you go to the next vessel and you keep doing that so that you minimize blood loss over the course of time. The second thing is there are measures for conserving blood to avoid transfusion. So most Jehovah's Witnesses, when it's explained carefully and when you keep it in a closed circuit with the body, are willing to accept cell saver. The use of normal volemic hemodilution is widespread. Uh, most Jehovah's Witnesses are willing to accept heart-lung machines and um, hemodialysis. And so if you explain to them that these devices to conserve blood are similar to, to the heart bypass and to, um, to hemodialysis mach machines, most of them are willing to accept it. Um, using uh, things, other techniques to minimize blood loss like uterine artery embolization in women who are hemorrhaging. We actually have a series of patients, very complicated women, who have large fibroid uteruses, heavy bleeding, severe anemia, Jehovah's Witness, pulmonary embolus from the compression of the, the, the major vessels in the pelvis, and you wind up having to treat them, anticoagulate them, and treat them when their hemoglobins are three and four and five. And you can do it. The third pillar of care uh, in patient blood management is optimization of physiology uh, in order to allow the patient to tolerate what is sometimes a severe anemia. So ranging from the simplest thing like uh, we saw someone who had a hemoglobin of three and a half who whenever she would get out of bed to walk to the bathroom would get chest pain. So we said don't get up and walk to the bathroom, stay in bed. <laughs> but there are other things you can do that are a little more radical, intubating patients, paralyzing them, sedating them eliminating rigors when there are fevers, doing things that reduce oxygen consumption, all can be done in order to minimize the, uh, the, the metabolic needs for oxygen. So we talked a little bit about this. Uh, I think about it in the surgical patient or the pre-procedure patient, uh, sort of optimizing the patient by correcting anemia, uh, coagulation uh, abnormalities, um, estimating anticipated blood loss and, and planning for that. So for instance, at, uh, our orthopedic colleagues are really quite good at that. They know when they do an elective knee replacement how much blood they're going to lose. So if you do the math, they can double that if they do both knees. And so for Jehovah's Witnesses, for the most part, the orthopedist will not do both knees at the same time. They're elective procedures, so they bring the patient back for a second procedure. So that's the sort of planning that goes into caring for patients who can't accept transfusion. And by the way, autologous donation is not an option for Jehovah's Witnesses because they cannot accept blood once it has left the body. So even if it's their own blood, the fact that it left them and now they're, uh, you're offering it back to them, they cannot accept it. Intraoperative approach, I talked a little bit about that, about tissue handling and uh, continual hemostasis. Um, keeping the patient warm is important because when the patient gets cold intraoperatively, coagulation is not as efficient uh, using normal saline, which is an irrigant commonly used in surgical procedures, uh, can affect 
negatively the coagulation cascade, and so using uh, balanced salt solutions is better. Um, and maintaining volume is, is really quite important. If you think about the, the anemic patient, the ones that we see, the women who've had menorrhagia for months and years uh, on end who walk in with a hemoglobin of five are very well compensated, very well equilibrated because they're normal volemic. That's totally different from the same patient who comes in after a trauma and drops a hemoglobin from 12 to five um, without uh, maintenance of blood volume. The microcirculation can handle it and can extract oxygen much more efficiently if the, if the patient is normal volemic. Uh, Post-operative care, we talked about some of these. And one of the vital things, uh, I think if you look around your institution, as we did in ours, uh, especially the critical care units, um, you're probably using standard adult tubes for drawing blood. Uh, we went to, to smaller adult tubes for everybody and for patients who can't accept blood, it's recommended that you use either pediatric tubes or micro uh, sampling techniques in the uh, ICU. The second thing, does anybody know what the most, any of the residents know what the most common indication is for blood drawing in the intensive care unit? Sunrise. <laughs> so it is, uh, it's recommended that the use of routine blood sampling is eliminated, that every blood test has to be thought about and ordered individually to avoid that routine sampling where you look back and you say, why did I need that? I mean, how many times a day do you have to do a hemoglobin in a non-bleeding patient who you can't transfuse anyway? Okay, uh, maintaining intravascular volume is vital. Um, treat uh, suspected bleeding very aggressively. The tendency is when someone can't accept transfusion, everybody wants to avoid taking them to the operating room. The reality is you have to take them sooner. You can't wait to fool around to see if the bleeding stops on its own. The fact is they don't have the reserve, there are, there are fewer options. So another example, when uh, we see a fair number of women with fibroids who can't accept transfusion, who need a, a myomectomy, I tell them all that if you're going to have a myomectomy, you have to recognize that although we try to save the uterus, your chance of losing your uterus is higher than someone else's because we don't have the ability to spend as much time trying to keep you, to, trying to stop the bleeding from your bleeding uterus. And pretty much all of them accept that as long as they understand that we're going to do everything we can to give them the outcome they're looking for. Uh, aggressive anemia management with iron and ESAs is really vital. Uh, perioperatively, there's lots of evidence to show that giving iron and ESA even prior to surgery can reduce the need for transfusion in the general surgical population after the surgery. And some of it may be psychological that the surgeon knows I've already given her treatment and in a few days her hemoglobin is going to be higher, so um, I can wait a little bit. Um, some of it may be actually physiologic, so if you look at reticulocyte counts, within a very short time, reticulocytosis has already begun after IV iron and uh, ESAs, within probably three days. This is a case report that I just wanted to show you very briefly that, that kind of is an illustration of the use of all of these techniques. Someone, um, you know, every, we're all looking for protocols. We would love to have a protocol that says, uh, you, your a patient comes in with this illness, you do A, B, C, and D. Well, it doesn't really exist. Sometimes you just have to be creative and clever and use common sense. And so this is a, sort of a, an overview of a patient who came to a hospital in Denmark with um, blunt trauma, uh, ruptured spleen, multiple rib fractures, a hematoma, a subcutaneous hematoma that went from his nipple line all the way down to his knee on the left side, two liters of blood in a, that came out of a chest tube, and our arrival, his hemoglobin was six and a half. So these are all the things that were done. A chest tube was put in. Unfortunately, they did not use a cell saver. There's so many things that, in retrospect, you think about that we don't do all the time. It takes a long time to change the way people think. So it's taken me years, but my residents, when they have someone who now has a ruptured ectopic, they say, oh, we're going into the belly that's full of blood. Let's get the cell saver. So that's the kind of reflex that you want to engender that if you know there's going to be blood somewhere, try to salvage it and give it back to the patient. Uh, Secondly, uh, the patient was found to have um, bowel injury as a result of this fall with bowel perforations, so the cell saver was not used there. Well, the fact of the matter is the literature shows that you can use it there. There are many, there are, there are reports of um, abdominal trauma with fecal contamination of the peritoneal cavity, and there is no difference in outcome because you wash the red cells that you collect and re before you reinfuse them, you use filters and use antibiotics. And all of those things put together 
uh, cause there to be no increase in risk using cell saver, even in a contaminated field. Uh, the intensive care unit, um, in the intensive care unit, this individual's hemoglobin dropped to three and a half. The patient was intubated, sedated, uh, mechanical ventilation with a high oxygen concentration. Uh, the patient was given IV iron and erythropoietin. And by the way, um, if you look at patients in ICUs, anybody who's in an ICU for more than a week has a significant chance of being transfused. And if you look at the amount of blood they're transfused, 50% of it is equi equal to the blood that was taken in blood testing. So minimizing the amount of blood draw sounds like a little thing, but it's a huge contributor. The other thing is that people with severe illnesses become anemic more, uh, more rapidly uh, when they're that ill, they're inflammatory, you know, the inflammatory portion of their illness contributes to that as well. So early uh, use of iron and erythropoietin really can make a difference. The other uh, wonder drug of the, uh, of the moment is tranexamic acid. It's been used, it's a, uh, an antifibrinolytic agent, as you know, uh, similar to aminocaproic acid. It is extremely effective in every area in which it's been used. Everybody's worried about it increasing clotting, but that's not the mechanism of, of action. And there hasn't been one study that I'm aware of that shows increased complications related to clotting with tranexamic acid. What it does is it slows the breakdown of clots once they have formed. It does not increase the production of clots. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's, there's now, in obstetrics, there's uh, a, a paper that came out just about six weeks ago that reports um, significant, a one-third decrease in mortality from hemorrhage when tranexamic acid is used within the first three hours of diagnosing hemorrhage. It's used in trauma cases in the emergency room. It's used in orthopedics. Uh, it really appears to work very well, but not without all the other stuff. You can't just say, give her some tranexamic acid, she'll be fine. Okay, so this individual, or the other thing that's uh, a myth that people don't realize is that the rapidity with which a severely anemic patient's hemoglobin resolves. When you treat, pro when you treat the anema aggressively with, um, with IV iron and when necessary, um, erythrocyte stimulating agents, erythropoietin. And in fact, you see a reticulocytosis within about three days, and you should expect to see a one gram rise in hemoglobin level per week, sometimes even more than that, especially if someone is severely anemic. And especially in, in many of these patients, we use super high levels. Uh, erythropoietin has been shown to uh, be, the, the response to erythropoietin is dose related. So if you give more eryth erythropoietin, you tend to see a faster rise in hemoglobin. So this individual, within five days of um, their, of his first surgery had a rise in hemoglobin of a point and a half, and by the time he went home, which was several weeks later, um, 11.2. And this, you know, everything I'm telling you can be applied to the general patient as well. If, you, if I were in the hospital and I was stable and my hemoglobin were six, I'd want to get IV iron as opposed to getting blood. This is, um, comes from a report in 2013 um, it's a government report, the National Summit on Overuse is looking for ways, of course, in healthcare to save some money. And what, you know, as you know, there's so much data now about uh, multiple approaches and multiple costs for treating the same disease in different parts of the country, even the same, the different parts of, a, of an individual state. And what they identified is five um, particular areas where there's felt to be overuse of healthcare modalities, and one of them is blood transfusion. Uh, so you say, okay, but you know, we're all taught to transfuse in this situation and that situation. Well, how many of you ever had a lecture on the appropriate use of transfusion in medical school? So that's about right. So in my opinion, we'll never really change uh, as, as thoroughly and as deeply the way blood is used until we start educating people in the medical schools about what's appropriate when it's uh, when, what is the, where there is evidence for the use of transfusion. There are now at least four major studies in the New England Journal of Medicine, extremely well done, controlled studies, looking at people with significant severe illnesses, looking at very elderly people, showing that what's called a restrictive transfusion approach works as well with as good outcomes as a more liberal transfusion output, uh, um, uh, protocol. And this is the, really the first one. It's called the TRIC trial. Most of you may be aware of it. It's from Canada, and it was a look at, um, at uh, severity-matched uh, controls and patients who, um, some of whom were 
not transfused until their hemoglobin dropped to seven, and the control, uh, the non, -con I'm sorry, the control group was transfused when their hemoglobins dropped to nine, and the outcomes were equivalent. Since that time, there are three others. This one talks about hip surgery. This included in this study are patients who are in their 80s and 90s who uh, did just as well with a restrictive transfusion approach as a liberal. This is upper GI bleeding, and this is septic shock. So in, in virtually every field that's been looked at, approaches that minimize the use of transfusion work as well as those that use transfusion quite liberally. So there are changing viewpoints. All of this stuff that we have learned from caring for patients who, who cannot accept transfusion really are applicable. And um, the world is looking at this, including the Joint Commission and the AABB, the Association of Blood Banks. Um, and they're putting in place uh, protocols to assess how we are doing in terms of appropriate use of transfusion. And now it's in the public. This is a, a series of three articles from the New Yorker magazine that came out uh, just about two years ago, um, looking at, talking about the, everything I'm telling you now, that the, the use of these non-transfusion techniques has taught us that they may be the most appropriate way to care for people, even those who cannot, uh, who can accept transfusion. And once it gets into the Wall Street Journal, we're all in trouble, you know. <laughs> um, this is the Joint Commission's performance measures that they are uh, planning to look at hospitals with. Um, as you can see, some of them have to do with how rapidly transfusion is available when it's appropriate, but also things like um, how it's administered, uh, the diagnosis for which it's being administered, whether or not you're checking a hemoglobin level before each unit of blood so that you only transfuse one unit of blood at a time as opposed to the traditional two units, give them two units. And so all of that is being looked at by um, the authorities. And this is just a look at a, sort of a summary of that. And outcomes, of course, are very important. So this is sort of a summary of um, the approach to patient blood management. And what I wanted you to see in this slide is that patient outcomes are right in the center of all of this. So everything we do is meant to improve patient outcomes. And so how do we approach this? This is a laminated card that we give all our new house staff on the first day of residency. Uh, it's four, one, two, three, four-sided. Uh, you're looking at the outside, it then folds down that green-white interface. But you can see here on the back, there's a reminder about Jehovah's Witnesses and, a, and bloodless patients and what they will and will not accept. And then there are some very quick reminders about what you do when you have a patient who falls into this category. And one of the first things is to call the blood management team. And Sandra's going to talk to you a little bit more about what that involves and what the blood management team will do uh, once introduced to that patient. And then this is the algorithm that we use for transfusion. When I first came to Beth Israel Hospital in 1999, the uh, transfusion was somewhere up here. Now transfusion is all the way down here. And you can see there's a, a proviso, do not automatically transfuse. Consider transfusion if hemoglobin is less than seven, but consider alternatives to transfusion if you have a stable anemic patient. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Sandra Gilmore, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the day-to-day um, -day administrative care of these patients. Sandra, I think this is it. You should be doing this. You're much better at it. <laughs> All right, slideshow. Here it is. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as uh, Dr. Friedman mentioned, um, I am the administrative director for our patient blood management program at Beth Israel, and I thought I'd start out with this slide um, that, that talks about how we're responding to community needs, because a very interesting thing happened when Beth Israel be became a part of the Mount Sinai Health System. Um, members of the Jehovah's Witness community started to assume, and that includes the headquarters for Jehovah's Witnesses, they began to assume that because we were now Mount Sinai Beth Israel, that the entire Mount Sinai Health System now had arrangements for a bloodless medicine and surgery program. And of course, um, at the time, that was not the case. Um, another thing uh, that happened was that 
as we started to restructure Beth Israel, quite a few of our surgical specialists and medical specialists were now being relocated to other Mount Sinai hospitals. They also took that patient population they were caring for with them and also their interest in bloodless medicine and surgery. So um, fortunately and happily, we received the green light from the health system to systemize our blood management program, which is what we're in the process of doing. So that was uh, very good news for us to receive. Um, one of the things that we had to do initially was to present to the Quality Council. And I asked myself, what could I possibly say to the Quality Council to convince them that this is a viable program and a program that we should systemize? So I went to the Mount Sinai Health Systems website, and I took these exact words from a very successful program um, that was within the system already, and I took the name of that program out and put Jehovah's Witnesses um, only because they are the majority of our bloodless patients. But I wanted to um, remind them and remind uh, ourselves of what the Mount Sinai Health System's uh, commitment was. And basically, it reminded us all that we're dedicated to meeting the health care needs of Jehovah's Witnesses who are included in our patient population by offering them medical and educational services, taking an active role in promoting their health equity and access to that care, and partnering with organizations to our, who are committed to addressing the needs of, of the individuals in this community. So that was the slide we started out with. And then I realized that most of the successful or all of the successful programs within, within our system had a common goal. And that is to deliver the highest quality primary and specialty care to our targeted population at all levels. I'm sure that everyone in this room, like most medical professionals, when they hear the name Jehovah's Witnesses, they immediately think about the critically ill Jehovah's Witness who won't accept a blood transfusion, such as the one that Dr. Friedman mentioned with the hemoglobin level of 3.5. Um, I can tell you those patients, the critically ill Jehovah's Witnesses, who will not accept a blood transfusion are probably the very smallest of the, the amount of people in our group that we see in our program. And this is the third hospital where I've been involved in developing this type of program. And the majority of them are exactly what is uh, spoken about here in this goal. They are members of the community who are basically looking for excellent primary and specialty care. So to give you an idea of what that community um, is comprised of, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they're an international uh, organization. And again, I'm speaking about Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, only because, as Dr. Friedman mentioned, 80 to 85 percent of our patient, patients enrolled in our program are Jehovah's Witnesses but we do get quite a few non-witness patients enrolling in our program. But just to give you an idea, currently Beth Israel Medical Center is the only hospital on the borough of Manhattan that has a formal bloodless medicine and surgery program. If you take a look at how many Jehovah's Witnesses are located in Manhattan alone, you have uh, 50 congregations, and congregations are basically groups of Jehovah's Witnesses who meet at their local places of worship. Each of these congregations hold about an average of 100 adults. So that doesn't include children. So we're looking at 100 plus in each of these, these 50 congregations on the borough of Manhattan alone. Those congregations start in lower Manhattan and they go all the way up to uh, Washington Heights. So there's a large population of Jehovah's Witnesses located right within walking distance of Mount Sinai Hospital. There are no hospitals in the Bronx that currently have a bloodless medicine and surgery program, although I've heard some rumblings recently that Montefiore is considering it. But so far, that patient population in the Bronx, they are coming into the city, into our health system to receive this primary and specialty care. There is only one hospital in Brooklyn that has a bloodless program, and that's Maimonides. One hospital in Queens, uh, that is Forest Hills Hospital, which is part of North Shore and uh, one hospital in Staten Island, uh, and that is um, Staten Island University Hospital, I believe. So as far as their care, they're at receiving excellent primary and specialty care. The majority of Jehovah's Witnesses in the city of, of uh, New York are coming into our health system looking for this, this care because of the, the reputation of our program. And again, this is just an overview of, of the list of programs that exist in the health system. And I also forgot to mention Lawrence Hospital, which is part of New York Presbyterian, or Columbia Presbyterian, and Westchester also has a program. Just to clear up also some common misconceptions about Jehovah's Witnesses. The first, uh, most people believe that Jehovah's Witnesses um, don't believe in medicine and medical treatments. Um, and it's quite the opposite. 
Jehovah's Witnesses are looking for excellent medical care. They're just asking that you do not transfuse them when administering that care or offering that care. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe in faith healing. They do not. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in medicine and they appreciate the, uh, the effects of medicine and good medical care. Many Jehovah's Witnesses, including children, die each year as a result of refusing blood transfusion. That is not true and it is heavily exaggerated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for almost 15 years. And this year, actually last year, late last year, was the first uh, time I had a patient or I was involved in the care of a patient who actually died as a result of a refusal of blood. So one patient in 15 years, as far as my own personal experience is concerned, is, is what, um, what I, I, I focus on. The bloodless medicine and surgery program is available at all Mount Sinai hospitals, and the fact is soon, because again, we received the green light to systemize our program. Um, keeping in mind something that Jeho um, Dr. Friedman touched on earlier, when Jehovah's Witnesses refuse a blood transfusion, they're not making a clinical decision. Um, it's a clinical uh, decision that we're asking them to make, but when they're called upon to consider whether or not they will receive a blood transfusion, it's a moral decision for them. So asking one of Jehovah's Witnesses if they would be willing to accept a blood transfusion is asking them how they view murder, how they view an adulterous relationship, because all those things are bundled into these same four scriptural references that they take very seriously. The important thing to remember, though, is that while Jehovah's Witnesses are refusing a blood transfusion, and their understanding of that is a refusal of red cells, platelets, and plasma, many of them will consider the use of minor blood fractions. So in their refusal, they're refusing whole packed, uh, packed red cells, platelets, plasma, white cells. Dr. Friedman also mentioned any technique involving the use of their own blood. Just to elaborate on that, um, because I've been asked in the past, well, how can Jehovah's Witnesses accept, accept cell saver or hemodilution if they won't accept a procedure where their blood leaves the body? The issue is not so much that the blood is leaving the body, the issue is storage. On their legal document, on their health care proxy, Jehovah's Witnesses state that they will not accept a procedure involving the use of their own blood if the blood is collected, stored, and used later. So when it comes to procedures like hemodialysis, when it comes to a procedure like cell saver, hemodilution, as long as it's part of a continuous cycle or a closed circuit, the average Jehovah's Witness will accept that procedure. Many Jehovah's Witnesses come in educated with the knowledge that there are alternatives available to them in the form of medication and these procedures involving their own blood. I will tell you that the best way to shut one of Jehovah's Witnesses down when, and when starting this conversation is to tell them that you're about to talk to them or you want to discuss blood products with them. Because they will automatically assume that you're talking about something that has blood in it or that you're talking about those four major components of blood. So their terminology when it comes to the use of um, transfusion alternatives as far as medicine is concerned is the use of minor blood fractions because that's how it's referred to on their healthcare proxy organizationally. What do they know these minor fractions to be? Uh, here's a list of some of the more commonly used minor blood fractions or medications that many Jehovah's Witnesses are familiar with that are used in various situations, including cryoprecipitate. Um, I walked in on a resident who was talking to a patient that had just had a bloodless Whipple. Her hemoglobin was down to 7.4. She was uh, resting well in her room. She was stable, a little tired. Um, and the, the resident went into her room and said, Mrs. So-and-so, I noticed on your health care proxy that you would be willing to accept some minor blood fractions. And she said, yes. So he says, well, I'm going to go ahead and order some FFP. So I was about to run into the room, and I heard the patient's little voice say, well, what is FFP? And he said to her, it's a minor blood fraction. So that's when I walked into the room, and I asked him to step out into the room. And I, I stepped out of the room, and I said, why are you offering her FFP if on her health care proxy she said that she was not willing to accept plasma? He saw on her health care proxy that she was willing to accept cryo, and assumed, oh, we can order FFP, but that was not the case. Because again, the problem is with the four major components of blood, but anything that's been separated from one of those four major components, including cryo, is usually something that will be considered by the average Jehovah's Witnesses and, and deemed as acceptable. Uh, these are some of the procedures involving the use of a patient's own blood. 
Um, probably the one that we use the most is uh, cell salvage, both intraoperative and postoperative. Um, our orthopedic surgeons use it the, mo uh, the most as far as postoperative is concerned, but we've also had discussions with our cardiac surgeons about the benefit of postoperative cell salvage as well. And also when it comes to organ transplants and donations, that is a matter of conscience. So while there is an organizational directive for Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to the refusal of these components of blood, when it comes to the use of minor blood fractions and procedures involving a patient's own blood, these are a matter of individual choice and decision. And what can determine whether or not a patient is willing to accept these alternatives has everything to do with the conversation you have with them and how, many de how much detail and information is provided to them when they're being asked to consider these transfusion alternatives. So that's why we have a formal program in place. And in putting this formal program in place, we came up with various forms. One is an enrollment form. This enrollment form is basically our way of assuring our patient population we are aware of your needs and we're willing to respect your wishes under any and all circumstances. Gives them the opportunity to also provide us with a, care, a copy of their health care proxy or complete one during their consultation. So this gives them some assurance and kind of causes their shoulders to drop a little bit when they see in writing that we have a formal mechanism in place that's willing to respect their wishes. Our second form is called Supporting Documentation to Healthcare Proxy. This form restates their wishes about their refusal of blood, again reminding them that we are totally aware of what that means and what their understanding of it is. It also, however, lists all of the transfusion alternatives in the form of medications and procedures involving their own blood, giving them the opportunity to check off whether they accept or refuse them. In my experience, uh, and Dr. Friedman can, can attest to this, most Jehovah's Witnesses, if you spend time talking to them about the individual medications and procedures, their roles and their uses, many of them will accept, I'd say about 98% of Jehovah's Witnesses will accept almost everything on this list. And this is what I meant when I said, if you put a form like this in front of one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you say, well, I want to talk to you about these blood products, it will shut them down immediately because, again, they would automatically assume that you're offering something that contains blood. We also have a form in place um, when it comes to the refusal of treatment for minors. It's not a consent form. It's an opportunity for us to have a discussion with the patients about what New York State law says. So it's a reminder to the patient about what New York State law means to them, but also what it means to us as a healthcare institution, what their rights are, but also what our rights are as medical professionals when it comes to that refusal of treatment. Most parents, or almost all the parents we've ever presented this form to, and it's, in our case it's been um, new moms or expecting moms, uh, knowing this information up front and knowing what they may be faced with legally up front makes a big difference as opposed to coming in after something has already gone wrong and telling them that you're about to call the authorities. So our program development essentials when we're moving forward with systemizing the program is to identify good system leadership and expertise uh, so that we can put that support infrastructure in place. One of our primary focuses uh, will be anemia management. I had a conversation with someone the other day and talking about bloodless medicine and surgery and uh, it was someone who um, had just taken on my role in another hospital. And I said, you know, I, I kind of almost have to separate it. I said, because bloodless surgery is, what was the word you used when I said the difference between bloodless medicine and surgery? Bloodless surgery is almost in a box. You have your tools, you have your techniques, you go into an OR, you do the procedure, finite. And then the patient is, is resting comfortably. Bloodless medicine can sometimes be a lot more complicated only because it's more time consuming. So to take a surgical patient for a few hours in the OR, okay, not that I'm minimizing the role of surgeons because they're definitely needed and important, but once you move this patient out of the operating room and they're now in the hands of medicine or the medical profession, medicine professionals, their role actually becomes somewhat bigger because now they have to not only continue to optimize that patient's care, but they have to keep that patient stable, especially in uh, arenas like the ICU and also the emergency room. So when it comes to um, identifying 
expertise. We're not just looking for surgical expertise, but definitely that expertise on the medicine side, because those are the ones who have to maintain the health and care of those patients. Uh, easily recognizable identifiers. You would be surprised at how many Jehovah's Witnesses come into your facility and you don't know it. Because most Jehovah's Witnesses will only speak up about their religion if they're having surgery or if they're on one of the medicine floors and something is going wrong, such as a GI bleed, and they're now faced with the issue of transfusion. But mo I'd say many, many, many Jehovah's Witnesses are coming in and out of your facility and they're not being identified. The reason why it's important to identify these patients early you want to know who the patient is before they encounter that GI bleed or before their, um, their, care, their uh, condition takes a turn for the worse because then you can prepare on how to care for them. We also want to make sure that appropriate documentation is in place that expresses the patient's wishes. Not just the healthcare proxy, which is important, but also on our surgical forms. How many surgeons would like to find out that they're about to do a liver surgery on a patient and didn't know until the morning of surgery that that patient was one of Jehovah's Witnesses? So finding out ahead of time that you're dealing with one of Jehovah's Witnesses by changing forms such as our surgical scheduling form, our surgical consent form, asks our patients giving their physician the authority or giving them permission or not giving them permission to transfuse them. We also have a question on our pre-questionnaire form about the issue of blood transfusion. Are you willing to accept a blood transfusion, yes or no? If your answer is yes, would you still say no if your situation became life-threatening? The reason why we added that second question was because when we just put, are you willing to accept a blood transfusion, most of the people in the holding area were saying no. And we were sending everyone up to the OR holding area with identifying bands that said no blood transfusion and their surgeons were going crazy. So we actually had to find out who were the patients who were refusing blood under any and all circumstances. We are currently in the process of uh, implementing system-wide blood management policies and procedures. Uh, there has been a system-wide steering committee formed with representation from all of our facilities, and they will be involved in, um, in helping us with these policies and protocols. We will offer continued education at all of our facilities, not just with our bloodless care, but also how we can accomplish some of those other things that Dr. Friedman mentioned, um, blood conservation how we can lower our transfusion rate uh, here, uh, not, only here, not only here at Mount Sinai, but throughout our system, so that we can qualify for that um, certification program with the Joint Commission and AABB. Right now, it's a three-level um, certification. If Beth Israel wanted to go for one of those levels, we at the time qualify because we do have a bloodless medicine and surgery program. But we decided as that steering committee that we wanted a system-wide certification. And the reason why we wanted that is because once we implement the program throughout the system, we will be the only healthcare system in the United States with a blood management and bloodless medicine and surgery program. You have other large institutions like um, uh, Johns Hopkins and other institutions that have multiple facilities, but they still only have the program in one of those facilities, and they direct the patient population to that one facility. We want to be able to provide this excellent care in all of our facilities, and that's unprecedented right now, and that's our goal. And we will continue to educate our patient population by offering uh, workshops for them as well, because we want to make sure that it's not only seamless for them, but we also want to make sure that the process of caring for them is, se is seamless for our, our clinical staff as well. So again, just a reminder, to deliver the highest quality primary and specialty care to our targeted population, and that's for all patients who, cons who won't consider blood as a treatment option. And that's at all levels of care in our health system. And I will close by saying, because I know um, there will be some question and answers later, so just in case there are uh, question and or any questions uh, involving uh, what Jehovah's Witnesses will and will not, not accept and what they believe, I personally do share that faith. So I can speak um, for the, that organization and answering any questions that you might have in that area as well. Thank you. During the 1970s, Manny Estioko, uh, a member of the cardiac surgery team, uh, who happened to have been married to a Jehovah's Witness, introduced bloodless surgery here. 
and uh, I was helping to run the intensive care unit at that time. I recall only one patient that he lost due to that issue. And with the question of the cell saver, the cell saver decisions were actually made by a committee of Jehovah's Witnesses, and Manny met with them, and they worked out what they would and would not accept with respect to those types of procedures. Thank you. Any other questions? One last question. Well, I just want to point out that this is an evolving issue. 20 years ago, it was official policy centrally with the Jehovah Witnesses that they would not accept minor blood products, and that included erythropoietin, not because there's anything wrong with erythropoietin, but because the manufacturers put some albumin in it to uh, prolong the shelf life of uh, their product. And uh, one of the things we learned was that what is being said centrally is not necessarily what the individual minister will tell to his uh, parishioners so that they don't have somebody who can say this is what is true for all Jehovah Witnesses. Sometimes you call up the minister of the individual patient and he will give a policy different from what was decided in the central office. Okay, well, one thing I can say, and, and again, it's not a, uh, necessarily a policy, because again, when you keep in mind you're dealing with ministers and not medical professionals, so basically any type of advice or, or um, suggestions or recommendations they're giving to their local parishioners is based on their own limited knowledge and sometimes their own personal choices, which they're, they have been recently advised against giving. So what Jehovah's Witnesses organizationally have been advised to do is to do additional research to see what is available to them in this area of transfusion alternatives, especially when it comes to the use of minor fractions, but also to form relationships with hospitals like ours here at Mount Sinai Health System so that they can get the education needed in making those choices. So it is a matter of personal decision. The only one, like I said, that's doctrinal is the refusal of those four major components. Anything else is a matter of personal decision. Yeah, it's, it's been my experience that what is really required is a standardized approach to explain all of these alternatives to that patient from someone they trust. And so when, it's at, when they're out in the community, they can hear different things from different people. Sandra's expertise is that she can sit down with them. For instance, she, she didn't mention this, but the very issue that you brought up, she had a patient who accepted albumin but refused erythropoietin. And so she explained to the patient that the only reason to refuse erythropoietin is that it's got albumin in it and you already accepted albumin. They understood and they accepted that alternative. So a lot of it has to do with the standardized approach where the, the uh, minor fraction can be explained in a way the patient understands. Another thing Sandra does, she explains to someone who will accept um, uh, hemodialysis, that cell salvage is virtually the same as hemodialysis in terms of the way that the thing is hooked up. And so many people understand that after talking to her and will accept it. And we always uh, listen to whatever the patient decided for themselves. But they often would call up their individual minister to get advice and not just listen to us. We have a lot of patients who call their rabbi the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Has the program expanded enough now so that if we need help here, we can call? Um, yes, we're in the process of putting together um, a notification. I mean, right now, we're still physically located at Beth Israel, and I do have days at um, Mount Sinai West, but we will be, I will be spending time also here at Mount Sinai one day a week. And I do get individual calls. For instance, there are about three patients here now that I've been working with. Um, one is a cardiac patient that was transferred from another facility. So there will be a notification with our contact information so that we can get involved even though there's no physical representation here yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.